Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51 Percent, a show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, a highly damning report reveals Mexico's police and armed forces routinely use torture and mistreat women during interrogation. Also, how the tech community is now reaching out to educate women refugees in the art of coding. And one small step for girls and one giant leap for the rest of us. Young African women are helping to send the continent's first privately owned satellite into space. But we begin in Mexico where the practices of both its police and armed forces have come under scrutiny. This after an Amnesty International report revealed that their personnel often use torture and sexual violence against women to obtain confessions. Our team on the ground sent through this report. This is an Amnesty International campaign video. The Mexico branch of the human rights organization interviewed 100 women who said they'd suffered abuse while in police custody. 72 of them said they were sexually assaulted. The results were more alarming than even we expected and you know, saying that we know a lot about this issue. And what we found is that sexual violence is the method of choice for security forces in this country when they are arresting women uh, accused of federal crimes in the war on drugs. Amnesty says the police pick on the easiest, most vulnerable targets, young women from poor backgrounds. With their consent, Amnesty published the names of 10 women. The reason why I did not keep quiet is that when I was in prison, I noticed that 99% of women who are there are tortured physically and mentally, and they incriminate them for crimes they did not commit. Then they say they've done their job. Taylin Wang says she was beaten and sexually assaulted by federal police. She told them she was pregnant. After hours of abuse, she had a miscarriage. Two state doctors examined her but did not report her allegations. She says they gave her paper towels and left her to bleed for five days. Her mother says Taylin is innocent but was forced to admit to being part of a kidnapping ring. They showed her photos, documents. She had to sign. She had to sign. The goal, whatever it took, was to get her signature. It was clear the police had been planning that all along. A day before its publication, Amnesty showed the report to Mexico's Attorney General. She released a statement saying she had taken note of Amnesty's efforts and recognised the importance of strengthening reporting and addressing specific cases. Mexico has made the so-called war on drugs a top priority. Police have been given more powers and want to get results. Amnesty suggests torturing women until they admit guilt is a way for police to boost their statistics and show the war on drugs is working. Now, as the world reels from the Brexit vote, where Britain voted to leave the EU, many say the result was largely driven by concerns over immigration, not to mention Europe's ongoing refugee crisis. However, while some may be pulling up the drawbridge, others are seeking solutions to offer help to the hundreds of thousands of people seeking a new life here on the continent. Joseph Ngu works for Techfugees, a not-for-profit organisation set up by the international tech community to meet their needs. She was also listed, by the way, in the 30 Under 30 for Social Entrepreneurship by Forbes magazine, and she joins me in the studio today. Josephine, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you very much. First of all, tell us a little bit more about Techfugees and how that came about. So Techfugees was started last September 2015 when um, the public opinion in Europe woke up to the photo of the baby island. And the tech community, especially in London, um, led by Mike Butcher, felt we need to discuss of how we can help because we felt we could do something with technology. I've worked for the last four years in immigration and technology, and I've seen how technology can really help people access information. Oh, so. Just give me some examples of exactly where it does help, particularly people who seem to have nothing but their smartphones in many cases. Yeah. I mean... It can help greatly get information or get in touch with their peers so that they get the right information to just 
go across Europe. But I think what we're trying to really do with tech refugees is answer their needs. They have five needs. One is um, having access to information in Wi-Fi. Second, education, the job market, so that they can get their dignity back and just integrate. Um, healthcare, as well as social inclusion. And social inclusion can be very broad. So in the scope of those five needs that we think refugees have to have sorted and helped very, very, like, quickly. Um, we've developed a network of hackathons, events, conferences, where hackers, um, tech entrepreneurs, as well as refugees, NGOs, would convene, talk, and discuss what can we do with those smartphones, create an app, create um, a sort of chatbot, is it using WhatsApp API to just get the information for the refugees to be safe on the road? So a lot of ideas came out of the hackathons, and now we're just filtering those um, those apps, those projects, through Base Fugees, a platform we've created online. Now, when you talk about using hackers, I mean, there's a very negative image about yeah. hackathons as such, right. and it's, it's somewhat sort of disconcerting when you actually hear you say, we were using hackers for good. It's a real good question. We actually make sure that everyone who comes to our event talk to refugees and talk to NGOs to understand really what is the challenge of the refugee and also what does the refugee need and not go wild and test out something that could make people die at sea, right? So we have a user-centered design approach as well as we care about privacy of data and security of data. And this is not just even a principle, it's a process that we're trying to teach at those events. So hacking, we hack in small groups just, and we don't deploy it until it's validated by the NGOs. But Josephine, the tech community is not really regarded as being generously spirited or community minded. So how difficult was it to actually get people on board? It's actually grown very big, very fast. We have now 27 chapters after 10 months since last September. We've grown so big very, very fast because I think there's a, there's a civic tech community that is appearing in Europe that wants to answer the crisis that we're faced right, with right now, as well as there is, I think, a bit of um, a boredom out of some software engineers working for tech companies and not seeing exactly where they're making an impact. There's a lot of comments on like the Generation Y and millennials uh, wanting to have an impact and wanting to have meaning in what they do. And I think... So they're not interested in just making billions and billions of euros? I think that's a bit of a prejudice that might be true in some part of the US. And I think in Europe, definitely, we're seeing another trend taking over. The other thing that you're doing, of course, is also offering education, particularly coding classes for refugees. I'm very interested in those coding classes for women. Tell me a little bit more about it. Yeah, so um, we, do, we do help those organisations that create coding classes for refugees. And for example, there's one uh, that just did a hackathon back in Berlin, Ready School. It creates opportunities for refugees to learn digital skills. And part of their courses, you find women. And it's, I think, very important that we include women in that conversation because women are a big chunk of those refugees. They're more vulnerable. We know that one out of 10 have uh, are pregnant and they're coming from sometimes traditional societies where the woman is not allowed to go out uh, in public and to work. And so we're trying to have them socially included so they understand that you're in Europe and you can do what you want to do. And, and we know there's a shortage of software engineers, women software, software engineers, so if we can show um, the difference uh, with refugees, women saying we can code and we're we're not a burden on society, we're actually a contribution, we are a resource. Um, I think it's very inspiring for a lot of other women, refugees or not. Josephine, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you. And finally, a group of African schoolgirls are being taught to quite literally reach for the stars. The company behind the continent's first privately launched satellite has enlisted their help to design its payload. Andrew Hillier has more. Could these schoolgirls be South Africa's future rocket scientists? As a first step, 
they're being trained to build and program these tiny robots. Their ultimate mission? To help send the continent's first privately owned satellite into orbit by deciding what it will be used for. In our most recent workshop, we've had the young women come into to, to our offices and work with satellite engineers as to what does the satellite need to study. The young women decided to study agriculture and food security over Africa. The company behind the initiative says that less than 10% of girls in Africa are interested in studying science and technology. Factors like poverty and, in some countries, forced marriage mean that far fewer women work in science-related fields compared to men. That's where programmes like this come in. They're aimed at getting more and more schoolgirls interested in the subject. This programme would help me a lot in terms of um, um, developing skills and having foundation skills for the future. The project isn't just limited to South Africa. Schoolgirls from countries across the continent are getting involved in similar workshops, from Namibia to Kenya and Rwanda. And here in Cape Town, it appears to be paying off. The most thing that I want to achieve is having an is having a planet named after me and probably work for NASA or actually build my own, my own company just like NASA. Already the ambitions of some students are quite literally out of this world. Truly impressive. And that's it for now. And if you'd like to comment on what you've just seen, you can head to our Facebook page. That's France 24, full stop, 51%. Or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. Thanks for your feedback so far. And please do keep those comments coming in. So until our next show, bye for now.